All right, hi everybody. This is Ben Jordan. I'm the CEO of ABV Technology. And I'm happy to be here talking to you guys about craft non-alcoholic beer, the methods, marketing, regulation, and stability issues surrounding that. Uh, this is a talk that I've given before and maybe one or two of you have heard it before, but I'm very excited to be presenting here at this uh, virtual conference that teams put together. Um, and I hope that I can answer some questions that you might have about this segment. Uh, as always, um, feel, feel free to put comments into any of the places that you can, and I'll address those comments at the end of the talk. Um, I'm always interested in hearing what kind of concerns or questions you might have. Um, I'm gonna, with, without further ado, I'm gonna sort of continue on uh, with the talk here and we'll um, address any open questions at the end. So what are we gonna be talking about today? Well, we'll talk about some of the challenges and considerations around should we and how do we make NA beer as craft breweries? Uh, we'll talk about some of the methods and we'll try to address that question and revisit again, should your craft brewery make NA beer? Um, we'll talk about the marketing related issues, about how you might um, have different marketing concerns around NA, talk about regulation and compliance issues, as well as shelf stability and spoilage issues. Um, and that really kind of covers the suite that I feel is the introductory questions uh, around how do you get into NA. And then as a last stop, I'll just sort of mention, you know, what, what we at ABV do in this market and how we help enable people to make NA beer. So as I see it, well, the challenges in making non-alcoholic beer for craft breweries are several. Um, the key things are here is craft non-alcoholic beer demand continues to grow really rapidly. And I'll, I'll cite some statistics in a second, but know that year over year, we've seen you know, huge growth in this space. And that growth has been due primarily to people who are still drinking non -alcohol, still drinking alcoholic beer, wine, et cetera, but are also making the decision to more often drink non-alcoholic products along with whatever their experience is that they're having. This might mean people going out and having a beer at a brewery and then switching to an NA on a Wednesday night. This might mean a group of people who are going out as a couple or as a, a set of, uh, as a group, and one of the four people in that group decides they don't wanna drink alcohol that night, but they still go out to a tap room. Having these NA options has driven consumers who were already alcohol drinkers to also adopt non-alcoholic products. One that was interesting is the pandemic was something that accelerated this shift in consumer preferences. We saw, you know, I think the joke we all had at the beginning of the pandemic was around, uh, and maybe not so funny of a joke, but the joke was that everybody was drinking too much. And what was interesting is that sort of about three, four months into the pandemic, we started seeing a big shift in consumer preferences. And all of our brewery customers started seeing people really increase the demand for non-alcoholic craft beer. Um, you know, I won't get into the psychology there too much, but I think people wanted to see if they could, you know, they went through their binge drinking portion of the pandemic and wanted to figure out what some other choices were. And luckily craft beer was there to make, uh, to have offerings, uh, not only in the tap room now that we have tap rooms again, but on the store shelves. And what that allows it to, us to do as craft breweries is to really tailor to that new segment of consumers whether it's the person who drinks and wants to not drink for a night, the so-called sober curious individuals, uh, people who are maybe um, choosing not to drink alcohol for a host of other reasons, they can still come to the tap room and still buy our products. So there's a lot of technologies that exist for making NA beer and much of the presentation here is gonna be dedicated to what are those pieces of technology. We're gonna get you familiar with the different strategies that you can go through in order to make non-alcoholic beer and talk about what the advantages and disadvantages are so that based on your brand and your brewery and your demographic, you can make an educated decision as to what the right product, recipe, marketing, technical choices are. So without you know, any further ado, how do craft breweries make and market high quality non-alcoholic products and should they? Um, you know, I, I normally give this talk with a friend of mine and a customer of mine named Matt Schwant. Matt Schwant owns Bauhaus Brew Labs um, up here in Minneapolis. And when we give this talk, this is the set of his slides that he does. 
And I just want you to keep that in mind because it's coming from the a brewery owner here, not just me as the technology provider. So, you know, a lot of what he's seen when he's observed this non-alcoholic beer market was he said, basically, you know, non-alcoholic beer has clearly not been something that has been favored among consumers. In fact, coming into the start of our company, when, when ABV started back in 2017, we would say that non-alcoholic beer had a bad reputation. In fact, it was poor tasting. Uh, it had bad flavors and aromas. Um, it was that thing you, you know, your weird uncle drank, if you will. Um, and we wanted to change that. It was the purpose of starting the business. In fact, you know, the much like a lot of the beer prior to the craft beverage movement, non-alcoholic beer was in the same state. But then craft got a hold of it, and we've been able to grow and change that lack of consumer interest into some high consumer interest. We've been able to educate people about how the craft brewing process can make non-alcoholic beer better. And while there are some high capital costs associated with the tech, we've been able to find different ways as craft brewers to either find tech that fits the right need for our process scale or find creative brewing methods to help overcome some of those challenges. And because of that, times have changed. Non-alcoholic beers made a huge leap forward. Um, we've seen growth in the marketplace. We've seen huge changes in flavor and aroma profiles. And people like the taste of it. It's become a beverage that people seek out uh, and buy. Um, in addition to that, there are now a huge variety of flavor profiles available that weren't available in NA before. Uh, if you take that, you know, go back to 2010, there wasn't a hazy IPA NA back in 2010. There wasn't an imperial NA porter back in 2010. These are all things that have come to fruition based on the changes that we've made um, as an industry in the last five to 10 years. And luckily, a lot of that has also been driven by, you know, the, the elephant in the room, if you will, which is the big brewery players. Often what we're doing as craft breweries is somehow mirrored or related to the moves that the big brewing world is making. And big brewers have stepped up their game in the NA space as well. Their marketing efforts have shown that they're out there pushing Heineken Zero and Bud Zero and all of the different non-alcoholic products. Those are important changes because it also drives the craft brewer and consumer uh, preferences. Um, the last thing I'll say is that the barriers to entry have really lowered in the past few years. Uh, we're going to talk about different methods to producing these things, but the real big change that's happened is the changes in that tech. We've seen changes in the biological technology, the yeasts and other fermentation technology. We've seen changes in the separation technology. We've seen changes in safety packaging technology. Those are all important changes that have enabled this to happen. And the result is that, you know, as we say, that non-alcoholic craft beer is everywhere. Um, it's about, excuse me, <laughs> it is a uh, it is a $20 billion global market as of last year at the end of the year. It's about a $29 billion market by 2026. Um, Bud, Heineken, Guinness, Amstel, Coors, Labatt's, even old Milwaukee is in the game of making non-alcoholic beer. And as a result, craft has come along with it. Of course, the rise of athletic and, you know, even two roots and well-being and some of the other excellent uh, non-alcoholic craft beer providers in this space has been, you know, meteoric. And it's been really nice to see um, the, the folks uh, over at Athletic have been the real poster child here for success. And uh, they've been making some really great non-alcoholic beer. And that's because there's been significant investment into this space, even in the craft world. You know, I think that the most important thing that I realized early on in this process was that, in fact, you know, six out of 10 people in the United States that are adults don't drink alcoholic beverages. And that means there's, there's a big market for products like this. Um, and we're excited to be a part of it. So as a, as a sort of poster child here, I'll just start off with, you know, the, the Bauhaus Brew Lab folks came to us in 2019. And with all of those ideas in mind that I just got done talking about, they said, all right, we're interested in launching a non-alcoholic beer brand. And we had just started our company as well. And we paired together and said, all right, this is a great opportunity to launch a product and learn something about this space. Um, 
the brewery owner, Matt, he had had a personal health issue that stopped him from being able to drink alcohol. And that was the impetus for his uh, researching into this product. And luckily that coincided with a big change in the non-alcoholic beer world uh, that we saw all this growth. So for them, they were able to produce a product in about a year. They were using a separation technology to do so where they leveraged existing recipes and separated out the alcohol. And we'll talk about what those tech are. But as a result, from 2021 to 2022, they were able to see a 95% year-over-year growth in the sales of that product. Um, the sales have not been insignificant. It's their third or fourth largest SKU in their portfolio now, um, and they're one of the you know one of the most popular breweries up here in Minneapolis. Since then, they've launched additional styles. They've gone to a Hellas, which was their first one, from a Hellas, excuse me to a sour, to a Hefeweizen, to an amber lager, and they've actually re just recently released their hazy IPA. So why did they do it? Well, or how did they do it? Excuse me. Um, there were a couple different considerations that you can go through as a brewery when you're thinking about how to make non-alcoholic beer. Um, and as, as several, of, uh, several of the people in this industry have discussed uh, at uh, CBC, um, along with some of those great talks, often the answer here is a combination of all three of these or all four of these things, three of these things. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is halted fermentation and specialized yeast. This is an approach where you are using just changes in yeast and brewing technology to make a non-alcoholic beer from scratch or from basic methods. Then the other two things I'm going to discuss are separation processes. I'm going to talk about membrane filtration, and then I'm going to talk about thermal evaporative separation techniques. The combination of those three things are hybrid methods, and I'll touch on that at the end. Halted fermentation and specialized yeast. Basically, the idea here is that you're able to take your existing tech brewing equipment, and you're going to either use a custom yeast or a standard yeast and ferment up that beverage up to some ABV. It might be a lower ABV. It might be an ABV less than half a percent. And then you're going to take that partially or um, halted fermentation product and you're going to remove, you're going to add water into it in order to dilute it down to less than half a percent or at least just stop the fermentation before it reached half a percent. Now, using traditional yeasts here may lead to overly malty products. It may lead to the lack of some flavors that you might want. And so a number of different yeast companies have come up with some really great new yeasts that are able to produce some of the flavors that are in fully fermented products without doing full fermentation. This area is an active area of research. It's a place where um, a lot of different uh, folks are making a lot of progress right now. And so the idea, as I mentioned, is just gonna go back here. We want to prevent yeast from producing too much ethanol, or at least be able to have them produce a little amount enough that you can dilute back down to make a good beer. Options are to ferment less, to ferment more coldly or more slowly. Um, and you can use a number of different yeasts to do this. So specialized yeasts like any of the ones here from some of the great yeast companies that I've listed. Um, all of these companies are worth taking a look at because they are really doing a lot of active research in this area. Why do this approach? Well, there's no new equipment necessarily to buy. You might have to work with your existing yeast um, equipment in order to get the fermentation to work correctly if you're going to be re-fermenting. But generally, the costs are low as it uses most of your existing equipment. Now, the cost that's high here is in labor costs. It might take you a lot of turns in order to get the recipe right, but you're able to use your existing equipment. Um, moving on. The sec second piece of technology relies on a filtration approach. And at this point, before I go into either of the sort of ethanol filtration approaches, I just want to make the point that sort of, let's call it an opinion, but it's one of the reasons that um, I started the business that I did. Um, my personal view is that making good non-alcoholic products 
comes from a fully make comes from starting with a fully fermented alcoholic product. There are certain things that come through fermentation that are flavors and aromas that are really hard to synthesize without going through that full yeast metabolic process, without bringing it up to that ABV that has a high percentage ethanol, because there's a lot of things that happen during that fermentation process. Not only does yeast metabolism process a lot of the sugars and convert those into ethanol and carbon dioxide, but there are also side products that are created that are adding to the flavor and aroma that we get in fermented products. And, you know, this isn't just true for beer. This is true for wine, and cider, and really lots of different fermented things, um, kombucha, bread, or pickles for that matter. But the second more important or second equally important thing in fully fermented products is that the presence of ethanol leads um, to solvation. There's ethanol is a solvent. And when it is in the presence of plant material, it's able to separate certain compounds that are in plant material that you aren't able to separate without that solvent. So there are just certain things about a fully fermented beverage and starting off with that fully fermented beverage that can lead you to certain flavor profiles. I'm not saying there isn't going to be a market for products that don't start with fully fermented beverages. I'm just saying that there are certain recipes and flavors that are in the traditional beer world that are going to be hard to replicate. So starting with a fully fermented beverage, um, there are several ways to separate out the ethanol from that fully fermented beverage, because the goal here is to take that fully fermented beverage and gently remove out the ethanol fraction from it. How do you do that? Well, in membrane filtration processes, there's a number of different pieces here that could be used in order to do it. There's a reverse, reverse osmosis approach, there's a dialysis or osmotic distillation approach. There's pervaporation. These are all different words for describing different ways to use membrane processes to remove out different components of a system, of a, of a liquid. So when, you're, when you look at systems from various companies, and we'll look at some examples of those in a second, uh, they're going to be designing those systems to remove the ethanol and put the pieces back together. Uh, I like to think about these machines as taking beer, which is really, you know, a list of several hundred different chemicals. And those chemicals are sort of sorted by their size in the membrane filtration process. And your goal is to sort of shove that whole beer through a membrane and only separate out the aromatic fraction first and put that aside and then separate out the ethanol and put that aside and put that aromatic fraction back together with the rest of the beer. So usually these membrane filtration processes are um, really good at that, that particular, the automation of that particular uh, process. Benefits of them are they're low temperature uh, so that you avoid thermal degradation. Um, there's lots of different ways that you could separate out ethanol and keeping things from heating up is a really good thing because heat destroys a lot of the flavors and aromas in beer. Membrane processes are also easily scalable. It's great. They're easy to parallelize and scale up so that you can go from a one barrel per hour brewery to a hundred barrel an hour brewery and all it takes is capital. Uh, Dual outputs for non-alcoholic beer and hard seltzer are also a common result of membrane filtration process. And so, you know, we've seen the rise of two different new categories in the last couple of years. And to some extent, those aren't uncorrelated, right? The non-alcoholic beer world and the hard seltzer world have grown together because the byproduct of making non-alcoholic beer is an ethanol water base, which is often used for hard seltzer. Um, Concerns around membrane filtration processes are, um, they can be recipe limited, meaning depending on what you're switching between, whether you're going from one style to another, uh, you might end up with needing to have more membranes in order to switch between styles so that you don't overlap flavors and aromas. You may also have membrane clogging issues depending on the molecule size or particle size in various recipes. And so tuning those recipes and membrane processes to address those different recipe limitations um, is part of the membrane 
path that you go down. Uh, there are two processes that I'm highlighting here, although there are many, many more. Uh, uh, GIA's Aroma Plus system is sort of a large scale separation process. The GIA folks out here in Hudson, Wisconsin and their parent company back in Germany do an excellent job of making um, very high throughput membrane technology. Uh, also in Wisconsin, the Pro Brew folks make the Alchemator uh, for the startup craft breweries looking for a membrane process. Um, the Alchemator is a great place to start. Our third technology for separating and making non-alcoholic craft beer, uh, thermal and evaporative processes. Uh, these processes are, these are three examples of thermal and evaporative processes. We have something called a falling film evaporator. We have a continuous vacuum rectifier. We have a thin layer evaporator. They all work based on a very similar principle. I'm going to try to just summarize it in an easy way, which is just like in the membrane process, we're using particle size to separate out the ethanol. In the thermal and evaporative world, you're using the boiling point to do that. When I say the boiling point, what I mean is the, the point at which the liquid, uh, a, a molecule in that beer liquid turns into gas or turns into vapor, whichever word you want to use. And that point, that, that value, that temperature and pressure that makes it go from liquid to gas, that's called the boiling point. So when I think of a beer, I think of that beer as a list of all these different chemicals. And I know the boiling point of each one of those chemicals in terms of temperature and pressure. Well, a thermal and evaporative separation process takes in a fully fermented beer, boils off, all of the different uh, aromas and things that have a boiling point that are lower than the water, than the ethanol that's in that beer. And then it moves into a second stage and removes the ethanol. And just like in the membrane, it puts that arom aromatic fraction back together with the heavier stuff. And the result is that you get a non-alcoholic beer with an ethanol water byproduct. Now, I said boiling there, and I want to clarify that in a lot of vacuum, or sorry, in a lot of evaporative systems, uh, vacuum separation allows you to keep the boiling temperature low while also allowing you to do that evaporative separation. That avoids one of the biggest concerns about evaporative processes, which is that you heat up the beer too much. So you start again with a fully fermented beverage here. You're separating it by boiling point in multiple stages potentially, and you use the vacuum pressure to keep the temperature low. Benefits are recipe flexibility and scalability. You can, again, you can scale this thing as fast as you want, but you can also have recipe flexibility here, meaning that you can start with a very hazy, very turbid beer. You can switch over to a very golden clear Pilsner, and you don't have to switch out any of the um, there's no equipment to switch out in the process. You again have those same dual outputs like you do for membrane or yeah, for membrane, you have a non-alcoholic product as well as a hard seltzer product. Um, the trade-off here for thermal and evaporative processes is the utilities cost is a little bit higher. You've got to evaporate something out and then you've got to turn it back into a liquid and that requires a lot of glycol. And so you're your trade-off between membrane and thermal and evaporative systems that you need to weigh out is really that cost of membranes and labor cost and recipe flexibility with increased utility cost in the thermal side. And depending on who you are and which brewery you are, that might be weighted more heavily on one side or the other, depending on how many different styles you want to do. I'll give you a little insight into my thinking there. Um, you know, we make an evaporative separator at ABV. We specifically built our business around craft breweries. And so when we looked at the craft brewing space, we said, all right, what are the important things here? We needed flexibility of recipes. We needed scalability, but not too much. And we needed to be able to fit this thing into a sort of space that um, fit into a craft brewery. Uh, and it needed to be affordable. And so with all those things together, I landed on evaporative processes and that's allowed customers that use our technology to sort of uh, switch between recipes rapidly over the course of a season 
and do what Bauhaus did to have a full portfolio of non-alcoholic products so that they can fully take advantage of the seasonality and changing consumer preferences without having a huge cost of new equipment or um, lots of R&D costs as recipes changed. So some examples, you know, we, we make one of several different evaporative technologies. Uh, the, they come in small flavors like the equalizer on the right there in red. That's what we make at ABV. The flavor tech unit is another unit that's um, similarly sized, slightly larger. The Centec unit is a much bigger unit. Uh, Gia makes a unit. There are all sorts of different evaporative separators out there. Um, this isn't a sales pitch. So if you want to learn more about why we choose the things we choose and why we think our product's better, um, at the end, I'll give you a little more information and then you can always contact me or one of our sales reps. So as I mentioned, you know, in summary here, this table really lays out that halted fermentation and specialized yeasts versus membrane filtration versus thermal and evaporative methods. You, you've got a bunch of different trade-offs to consider. And I'll let you sort of take a look at this table, maybe screenshot now if you want to study this for later. Um, this is where there's a little bit of uh, trade-off R&D to be done. Regardless of which method you choose, there's something that needs to be considered along with it, and that's recipe modifications. There's a lot that can be done to make good non-alcoholic beer that has... Um, you know, that once you've made an equipment or a, a process choice, then most of the rest of the game is in recipe choices, like it should be, right? Craft brewers, that's the point, is that we're good at doing uh, the art side, the craft side of beer. Um, I'll lay out some of the real basic tools here, but um, there's going to be things that you need to do to address body and mouthfeel. Uh, for example, using multi or style choices or choosing malts that have a lot of non-fermentable sugars in them so that you end up with a lot of high residual gravity. Um, adding non-fermentable uh, sugars and other adjuncts to add back to that body after the beer process, so post-process additions, um, as well as just good old final gravity increase, meaning longer boils. Uh, all of this is going to add to more, lead to more sugar being in your base beverage and you're making up for that lack of ethanol that's in that beer. One of the common uh, concern, excuse me, one of the common concerns with non-alcoholic beer is the wateriness. It's that lack of body. And as a number of different craft brewers out there have shown, that can be overcome through um, modifications to the process. Uh, second, there's often a lack of aroma, um, a lack of some flavor retention. And I just want to give you a little insight into where that comes from, as well as some things you can do. Uh, the lack of ethanol actually changes the way we perceive beer. It's not only about, uh, you know, the process there, maybe removing some things, uh, depending on your process choice, but it also has to do with the way that your, your mouth and your throat and your nose perceive things in the absence of ethanol. Ethanol changes the way our uh, mouth biochemistry works and the receptors that are in your mouth and nose and throat actually do different things and uh, are less or more sensitive depending on whether ethanol is present. And so by removing ethanol, you're not only sort of changing the way that you perceive beer, which leads to changes in bitterness perception, as well as changes in sort of um, this maybe the, the burning sensation you might get in a little higher ABV beverage. Um, but it also, the lack of ethanol can also lead to a lack of vaporization. You've, you've increased the boiling point of beer without ethanol in it. And so it takes more energy to vaporize some of those aromatic molecules into your mouth. So when you pour a beer into your mouth and you smell it, that aroma that comes up through the back of your throat is going to be, it's going to take more heat to do that. And so you're going to perceive some of those aromas less um, when you drink a beer without alcohol. How do you overcome that? Well, um, there's a lot of process choice things that you can do there, whether you, you know, the machine that you choose to do this, whether it's a membrane or an evaporative system, 
each one of those machines has going to do a worse or better job at saving those aromas and flavors. Um, you know, the, the joke in this world uh, is whenever you're doing a separation process, if it smells good in the brewery when the machine's running, that's a bad thing. It means that all those aromas are going right out into the air and you don't want that. Uh, so process choice is one. Recipe modifications, there is the second thing again, and that's increasing the amount of hops that you might be dry hopping with. Um, it might be uh, doing a post-process hop oil addition that um, is specialized for doing aroma additions. There are a lot of different great companies out there that are doing aromatic hop oil additions that are really able to overcome some of those losses. I'll touch on a few more things here as we um, get towards the end of the talk. Uh, the uh, head retention is another place that is often challenging in the non-alcoholic beer world. Uh, this is for a number of reasons that have to do with chemistry again, um, but the augmentation of protein into your beer is one of the key ways you can retain head. Um, meaning that if you can do, for example, increase your oat or oat flake additions to your recipe, you'll be able to retain more of that head. It's going to be a little bit creamier. Um, I've also seen two other interesting things done. The addition of foam stabilizers into NA beer products is another great way to do that. There's a couple of products on the market that are available for doing foam stabilization. Um, and then lastly, an interesting one has been using a gas mix, uh, a mixture, a small mixture of nitrogen with your CO2. And the result has been a more stable foamy head, a little bit creamier, just like when you have something on a nitro pour. Um, acidity of pH is another category I want to mention, and it has to do less with flavor because really you're not changing much about pH when you do separation, uh, when you remove ethanol, but the lack of ethanol can lead to, uh, spoilage and shelf stability issues. One of the most important ways that you can overcome risks there in non-alcoholic beer is to keep your pH low. You're going to hear a lot of different numbers from a lot of different people. There are several great articles, one by the BA that just came up, by the Brewers Association that just came out. Um, you know, in today's talk, I'm going to use the number pH 4.2. Keeping that pH lower than 4.2 is a really good idea. Uh, and everyone's going to have slightly different preferences there. But the point is, is that keeping your pH low is going to be one more barrier to entry for any spoilage organisms. In a second, I'll talk more about shelf stability, but um, this is a place where increasing your maybe citric acid dosage or choosing uh, recipe styles like a sour, for example, that stays low in pH. That's a place where you can optimize your recipe choices in order to keep your uh, product shelf stable and safe. Um, the last thing is, is as we've, as we've gone into non-alcoholic beer, styles that are a little more non-traditional in this space. Um, things like haze and uh, hazy IPAs, for example, have required us to, to look at how these processes can maintain those hazes. Um, depending on which process choice you choose, you might filter out your haze when you're making your non-alcoholic hazy IPA. Uh, and you're going to have to look at not only how can that process be modified, maybe changes in membrane, membrane filtration size, or maybe using haze stabilizers like a tannic acid in order to maintain that haze uh, through your process so that you end up with a hazy IPA in that particular case. Um, at ABV, we have a, a document that's um, tips and tricks for making non-alcoholic beers. That's something we give out to our customers and quite frankly, would be happy to share with anybody who's um, interested. So reach out to myself or one of our sales reps after the presentation, and we'd be happy to share that more detailed um, document with anyone who's interested. So it's, as you may imagine, you know, as somebody who's really into the technology in this space, it's easy to get into the weeds here and try to understand uh, how it is that you can make really great non-alcoholic uh, beers. And one of the ways that we do that is process characterization and prediction. 
Um, this is a place where we've been able to make use of technology on top of our process to be able to understand more about what different things happen as you make a non-alcoholic beer. Um, what we did at ABV uh, is to take our process and take a non-alcoholic beer, take a fully alcoholic beer and measure some key properties inside of it. What are the concentrations of things like ethyl acetate, uh, uh, humulene, uh, other components like ethanol, for example, diacetyl in certain cases, really the sort of some really key indicators of different chemical species in beer. And we then passed them through our process and then made those same measurements afterwards, both in the non-alcoholic beer product of the machine, as well as in the um, FMB or the hard seltzer uh, output of the machine. And what we were able to learn and predict in fact is given a beer, if you know how much of some component is in that beer, we're able to do a pretty good job of predicting how much of that component is gonna end up in the non-alcoholic side as well as in the FMB or the hard seltzer side. And then we've tried to take that process characterization, the chemical level characterization, and learn from that and adapt it to tasting panels. And now we've been able to train our people internally and started to train our customers as well, how they can taste a beer and reference that document and say, okay, I've got a beer that has certain flavor and taste and aroma profiles. How is that gonna turn into an NA through this process? By no means is this exact, it's only something we've explored for our process, but it's something that's worth considering as you as a brewer think about how you want to address this. Um, Again, this document, our, our characterization, it's something we're happy to share. So again, get a hold of us and, and feel free to reach out. We'll be happy to share this sort of mapping between taste profile and, and where things go into the NA. Okay, enough technology for a second. Let's go into the marketing side where there's also plenty of technology before I get yelled at by my marketing people. But, um, different kind of technology. Uh, I just wanna mention a few things. Um, the marketing is a slightly different beast in the NA side of things. Uh, not, in addition to most of your traditional marketing efforts through social media and, and traditional uh, print advertisement, as well as um, brewery shows, conventions, uh, um, festivals, etc., there are a number of different places where you can also market to NA. Remember, you don't have alcohol in this product. And so there's a whole expansive place, uh, place for advertising that's now available to you. Um, you also may want to think about how you're going to address that new consumer demographic and reach out to a new group of people. Uh, they have different needs and different preferences. They're looking for different things. Um, you may want to consider having events at your brewery that aren't necessarily centered around another beer release that's fully alcoholic. Uh, Bauhaus, for example, has a number of different events that are, you know, in the middle of the day and the NA beer sales are excellent during those times. Second thing I'll mention is around non-alcoholic beer recipes. Uh, create your calendar just like you would for your regular non-alcoholic or your regular alcoholic beers. Uh, I would say that, you know, while it's not 100% accurate every year, most of our customers have seen the seasonality of their alcoholic beers mirror that of the success of their non-alcoholic beers. I'm sure that we're going to get more information about that as the years go on. And we're going to get good month to month data about non-alcoholic beer recipes. But right now, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna make a really good uh, Bach in the spring, consider making an NA Bach. If you're gonna make a great Heffa and a sour for the summer, consider making a non-alcoholic for the summer. Um, make a good NA Marzen in the fall, and release a good NA Pilsner, a good NA IPA, and keep those on year round. That's been the sort of basic success strategy. Basic success strategy. Um, dry, dry January launches have been a particularly uh, good, um, particularly effective strategy. What's happened uh, from a lot of our brewery customers, uh, 
at least anecdotally, what they've perceived is that those customers have, they've had new customers come into the brewery who have chosen not to drink during dry January or have at least been sober curious. And those behaviors and their brand loyalties have extended into the rest of the year. There's a lot of momentum in dry January, like it or not right now, that has been interesting for a lot of different breweries and leveraging that to bring new consumers in and get them to stick around for the rest of the year is uh, something worth doing. Um, by the way, I'll say that means, you know, getting started now on your brewing process for your non-alcoholic beers for dry January, as well as your labels and cans and all those things. Um, I will say that, you know, in terms of marketing, it's been more successful to create a separate brand and a different maybe brand look than just calling it the non-alcoholic version of your original beer. If you have brand XYZ, calling it NAXYZ isn't as effective as coming up with a new brand. I would follow that same brand strategy advice that you've seen in the seltzer world that coming up with a new brand and a new name has been the most effective way to get new eyes on the product. Uh, last thing I'll say is that you've got a whole bunch of new channels available to you in addition to all of your old channels. If you're a self-distribution company, you don't have any restrictions here that maybe somebody who has a distribution agreement would have. But in addition to having all of your distribution tools that you have available to you, you can put NA beer into other people's tap rooms where in some states you maybe couldn't. You can put it into bottle shops, which of course you could through distribution, but you might be able to put it into grocery stores where in some states you couldn't. Uh, and certainly you can ship it online and across state lines, which is an important uh, change in the way that you are able to move beer around this country. The next thing I want to talk about is from the regulation and compliance side of things. You know, this is probably the least fun part of the talk, uh, but you know, it's a very necessary portion here. Um, there are a number of different labeling considerations and formula considerations that you should look at when you're looking at making non-alcoholic beer. Um, I'm going to show you a excerpt from a great presentation that the TTB put on back in um, 2021 at the two CDCs ago. Uh, but they did a great job of laying out what a non-alcoholic beer label should have. I'll also mention that uh, if you're starting with a fully fermented product, and you're going to ship across state lines, you need a cola for that non-alcoholic beer. And in fact, if you're going to start with a fully fermented product and make an NA product, you still need a formula approval from the TTB for that input product. Uh, I'm not going to talk about any state to state regulations because we're a national you know, or international broadcast here, but um, if you have questions on that or we can help sort out some of those open concerns, happy to help with that. We've gotten really good at working with the states uh, to understand what they require. Um, just checking with your local and state regulatory agencies if they have any special requirements for you is always a good idea. Usually there's not much. Um, the other thing to consider is that once you make a non-alcoholic beer product, you're down below a 0.5% limit. And it's very important that you maintain an alcohol concentration that's below that 5% limit. Uh, you also are subject to food safety concerns from the FDA at that point. And so knowing what not only the TTB requires of you, but also what the FDA might require of you, depending on where you're shipping your product, uh, very important piece. I would say that uh, the recommendation I have here because of the length of this conversation and the detail involved is there's a great article by the Brewing and Brewers Association that just came out last month that talks about a lot of the sort of health, safety, and regulatory concerns that I really think is worth taking a look at. Um, I can drop that link. Uh, I can drop that link somewhere at the end of the talk and uh, make sure that people have that. Um, as an example, I just want to just point out what a good non-alcoholic beer label looks like. Again, this is an excerpt from the from the Tax and Trade Bureau. Uh, what they're pointing out here is that on the left, bad label. You didn't include the words non-taxable under Section 5051 IRC. Uh, you 
didn't put non-alcoholic, uh, sorry, you didn't put less than half a percent alcohol by volume, and you used the word beer instead of cereal, uh, beverage, malt beverage, or near beer. The label on the right is a good label. It's done those three things. Uh, this second one is an example of a label made by one of our customers up here in Minnesota. And you can see that it's got all of those different requirements um, met. Uh, the last piece of the talk here that I want to talk about is that I'm going to mention here on you know, why and how to make craft beer is under non-alcoholic beer spoilage and shelf stability. Um, this is a subject that requires a requires a good examination of your brewery and as well as your brewing processes in order to get this right. None of us want to make bad beer, but the lack of ethanol in non-alcoholic beer means that there's some additional risk. How you perceive and deal with that risk in your brewery, what brewing practices, quality control measures you put in place in order to address that um, is up to you. And there's a lot of different strategies. Uh, how you make the decisions around which pieces you employ and how much money you spend to do this here is really going to be a um, something that's up to each brewery. Uh, but the cost of a recall is high. So making sure that you have good data around the shelf stability of your beer and making sure that you've done the quality control procedures in advance to ensure you have good shelf stability is key. So what can all breweries do? Well, basic stuff. Keep your dissolved oxygen concentration low. Make sure that you've you're taking measurements in your brewing process and you keep that DO concentration low so that there isn't any oxygen available for uh, aerobic organisms to be able to feed on. Keep your pH low. That low pH is going to result in another barrier of growth for a lot of those spoilage organisms. Uh, and the lower that pH, the less likely it is for those organisms to be able to grow. Um, you know, on that note, I'll also say that keeping your count of spoilage organisms low in the brewer is good. While it's almost impossible to keep all spoilage organisms from being in the brewery, making sure that you don't have sources of spoilage organisms in your bottling line, for example, or in um, your bright tank is a really great way to keep that risk low. And by keeping that availability of cells that might spoil in the beer low, along with a low pH and low DO, um, you're able to avoid having that fuel necessary. Same thing with fermentable sugars. You don't want to have a bunch of fermentable sugars left over in your beer that are going to allow existing yeast or other things to be able to feed um, on those existing sugars. Once you've done all those things, there's still uh, a little more risk than you had before with regular beer. And so you have a question to ask yourself around what your strategy is going to be to inhibit the growth of those um, spoilage organisms. Preservatives are a choice here, and that's going to be something that you have to consider based on your brand recipe consumer demographic. Uh, sodium benzoate is a choice that's used in the software industry. Uh, potassium metabisulfate, potassium sorbate as a combination is another common one used in the uh, soft drink and beverage industry. Uh, there are also some other um, preservatives that can be examined that are um, coming out that are a little newer in the market. Uh, there's some um, all natural preservatives, one called Kyber that we've been researching. Can't recommend that one quite yet, but you know we've, we've seen at least okay results from some of the people who have been using it. Um, preservatives are one way that a lot of our customers have seen a lot of success in keeping high shelf stability. The, the other place that is I don't want to call it the gold standard necessarily, but it's a place that you can really be effective is pasteurization. Now, there's a lot of different ways to pasteurize. You might be able to pasteurize in line before you get to your bottling line. That's not as effective as the pasteurization of a fully bottled product. This is a way that you can, and I'm sure everyone's familiar with pasteurization, but you can kill the uh, remaining spoilage organisms that may be in a can by heating it to a certain temperature for a certain amount of time um, at a certain pressure for that matter. Uh, that's a way that you can really effectively 
sterilize or reduce the risk in a lot of your different product. The goal of all of these things here is to make sure that you have a long shelf stability and that you don't have any organisms left in your product that are going to hurt anybody. So when we go back and look at this list, prevent preventative measures are the place that I think is the most important. Don't put anything, don't have anything left in your beer that's going to cause you a whole bunch of risk. You know, a good NA beer that I, I wouldn't start your NA beer journey as a craft brewery with a fresh fruited um, lager. That's a bad place to start, especially if you aren't going to pasteurize or add preservatives. It's a dangerous place to start. In fact, I would start with something that has a lower pH that doesn't have any fermented sugars and that you've been able to um, add appropriate amounts of preservatives to. We have a lot of customers who blend these strategies and are very successful in seeing six, seven, eight months shelf lives before the product has the same, same shelf stability issues as any other beer meaning it just doesn't taste good anymore. Um, one last thing, make sure you have a good QC program. Make sure that you're taking samples and you're putting them in not only the cooler after you've bottled them, but also putting them at room temperature because your beer product, your Craft NA beer, isn't always going to be in a cooler, even as much as you want it to be, just like your regular beer products. And making sure that you are regularly sampling that um, set of cans and you have a good program in place that tests out those different uh, aged cans to ensure that you're not putting any of your customers at risk. Okay, so um, we're at 407 here. We've got about seven, eight minutes left. Um, let me briefly share with you what we do at ABV and how we fit into all this stuff that I've been just telling you. Uh, we were founded in 2017. Our goal was to make really good technology to help people make non-alcoholic craft beverages. <coughs> Excuse me. That means non-alcoholic craft beer. That means non-alcoholic wine. That means non-alcoholic cider. And it means non-alcoholic uh, spirits. Right now, we started in the craft be NA beer space, and we are active in the, um, excuse me, and we're very active in the NA wine space as well. These two have, uh, you know, grown rapidly over the last few years. And we see, you know, similar growth happening in the cider space and spirits is probably soon to follow. We are right here in Minnesota, in St. Paul, in fact. Um, many of you have either joined us at CBC and came and saw our facilities. Um, we manufacture everything here in Minnesota. We're also a production uh, brewery and winery here in Minnesota. And we keep a fleet of our machines here in Minnesota and process beer and wine for customers all around the Midwest in our own facility. I say that all to sort of let you know, not only are we manufacturing the equipment and selling the service, but we're also practicing what we preach. And we're out there brewing beer, we're out there processing beer, processing wine. We don't release any of our own brands. We have no brands that ABV owns or anything. We only work for our brewery and winery customers. We have two products. We have our equalizer. It's a thermal or evaporative distillation uh, dealkalization method. It is able to extract the alcohol from a beer or a wine or a cider and make an NA beer as well as an FMB byproduct. Uh, in terms of its operation, it can go into any brewery or winery and doesn't require any um, distilled spirits plant license or any distillation license. Uh, it is a, it, the, the summary of sort of that legal question that I get a lot is that you can, the beer that goes into or the wine that goes into the machine, the output of the uh, hard seltzer is the same ABV as the input. No alcohol is rectified. The alcohol concentration never changes inside the machine. We also sell a product called the analyzer. It does one thing. It measures ABV. As we started working with our customers out in this space and we realized how important it is to be able to measure ABV accurately for labeling, for uh, safety reasons, we looked at the space of, uh, space of uh, machines that could measure that accurately and realized there just wasn't a cost effective tool, similar to what we did when we made our equalizer. The analyzer does that and does it well for um, a very a much lower cost than some of the competition out there. 
both pieces of technology are available as a service or for purchase, meaning that you can buy our analyzer or equalizer, you can install it in your brewery, and you can start making NA beer tomorrow. You can also go to one of our partner facilities in Detroit, in New York, in California, in Colorado, and you can here in Minnesota. You can bring your beer to us in kegs or in IBC totes. We'll process it for you and send it back to you. And that allows you to sort of explore that NA space without having to make a huge capital investment right away. Uh, so we work, we have processing services in many locations around the country. If you're interested in putting a machine in your brewery and you want to also process beer for the breweries around you, that's our partnership program. We can help you with that. Um, and of course, our machines are available for purchase. The equalizer is this object. It's an evaporative separator, makes great NA beer for all the reasons I just got done talking to you about. Um, it works with all recipe styles. We make great hazy IPA NAs. We make great stouts. We make great, we made a peanut butter imperial porter the other week. There's the NA world is getting crazy. So if you want to be part of it, this is a great tool for doing it. Um, comes with you know full support. We monitor every recipe or every run through the cloud. Uh, it's a really great machine. Prices start at around $300,000. Uh, takes a couple months to get it into your facility. Um, we're happy to talk more about those details. Uh, as I mentioned, beer goes in anywhere between three and a half, and actually this number is now 12%. So anywhere between three and a half and 12%, we process at a barrel an hour through the base machine. We can go faster through um, some of the bigger models. What comes out is a non-alcoholic beer and hard seltzer. The non-alcoholic beer is always less than a half a percent. The hard seltzer, or what's called the FMB, is always at the ABV of the input beer. It also has no gluten, but it can't be labeled as gluten-free since it started with a gluten product. It has no flavor. It has no color. It has no sugar. Uh, it's just ethanol and water. The analyzer is our other piece of equipment. You open it up, you pour beer in the top, hit go, it tells you the ABV. Uh, those two pieces of equipment are um, available for purchase, processing, all those things. Here's some of our customers. These are mostly folks up here in Minnesota. I wanna thank them and some of our service partners, Eastern Market out of Detroit, BJ's in Reno, Fall River out in California, Captain Lawrence up in and with that, I'll sort of end and take a look at the comments and see if there's any additional questions. Wow. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> so I guess in the one minute I have here to uh, address these, I will say um, Imperial NA seems to be a contradiction from Josh Lindsay. Yeah, very much a contradiction. This whole NA world is full of contradictions. Um, I think that right now, not only is there an issue around the way that we talk about NA, but there's also lack of um, lack of categories in any of the shows so that we can even have a platform to talk about these things. Uh, what we need to see is the Great American Beer Festival's NA category expand, the Beer Cups category expand. Um, there's a lot of different questions there about how do we talk about the NA category in its own. So great question. Um, really appreciate that one, Josh. Um, unfortunately, you know, I'll write down these questions and I will uh, try to address them later. But unfortunately, we ran right up until the end time here. So I'm going to say thank you to everybody. Really appreciate uh, being invited to give this talk here. Um, my email address is ben at abvtechnology.com. And I'm happy to uh, help anybody with any questions that you might have. Thank you.